Good to have you all back for another episode of FinTech Hawaii's Human Human Architecture, broadcasting live from half around the world, from me near Munich, Germany, and back to Honolulu, Hawaii. And this is volume two of a very exciting show, which is, uh, we're still in COVID-19, and this is about um, some promising thoughts uh, about post-pandemic uh, production uh, propositions. And we're picking up from where we have left last time with our guest, uh, Kelly Keanu. Hi, Kelly. Hello, Martin. Good to have you back on the show. And let's get the first slide up. And, and our most exciting announcement is um, what we had ended on, if we can get the first slide for that. And this is your most important project. Not that the one we're talking about isn't important enough, but the most important project is the one at the very top end. And the last show, you were about to say, hey, maybe I have to step out because uh, my baby son's going to be born every second here. And, and kindly, he was waiting and giving us the time to finish the show. And then he arrived uh, soon later. So congratulations again. And here he is with proud dad. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And when you were sending me the pictures, uh, you sent them with a funny note and you said a fresh doctor of architecture here uh, to a, a doctor of delivery <laughs> of your son having to wear the mask, obviously. And so this way your son will remember that and, and also uh, experience uh, around what exciting other project uh, he was born. And that's the project we see two show quotations at the very bottom which is your crazy idea to make uh, substantial housing out of cocoa palms. And we ended on the note in the very bottom right that you uh, traveled all the way to where I am now, pretty close, close enough, um, basically to Christian Beck and crew and to test uh, what uh, you were uh, having uh, going on. And so let's go to the next slide and, and share today what you were doing uh, when you were back. Sure, exactly. So my research did lead me to uh, visiting Christian Beck and their team, and we got exciting results with their Ligno lock gun. So I wanted to bring that all that back to Hawaii and start doing my applied research. And so I collected, uh, I've been collecting a lot of uh, coconut uh, sources, um, coconut logs, um, since I decided that I wanted to do my coconut uh, project. So way back in August and October of 2019, I was already collecting my samples because I knew I wanted to work with them. And so these are a couple of logs that I had collected and I really wanted to emphasize my own personal understanding and uh, experience in working with the coconut wood. So I, from uh, scratch, from ground zero, slabbing up the logs. And um, from then I'm going to take it through the whole entire milling process. So here you have me slabbing up the logs and it's exciting to know in some of the research that I found in Australia on the bottom um, images, you'll see uh, some termite testing that was done. And so this referring back to the vascular bundles and the density of the vascular bundles. And so you see those samples uh, down along the bottom of the image where the ones on the right have a uh, low density of vascular bundles. So they got uh, eaten quite a bit by the termites, whereas the images on the left were they have high density of vascular bundles and they do great in uh, resisting termites. Mm -hmm. And that actually gets us to the next slide. You were ahead of ourselves here. So, that, so here we're on the slide where, again, we see you hands-on literally and figuratively. And at the very top, we see the, the images and the bundles of different kinds and how they sort of impact the, the strength of the wood, right? And as the little diagrams on the previous slide show in here as well at the bottom right, you have to be very strategic how you cut it out of the trunk, right? Because as you explained to us last time, reverse to conventional trees where the more to the core you get, the harder it is. Here it's actually the opposite, right? So the, 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 the middle part of the, of the is almost not usable, at, at least not for structural purposes. You know, it's very soft and in the periphery, uh, it's very strong. So again, let's jump to the next slide and see what else you did here. Uh, here again are section cuts of the bundles and maybe again explain a little bit more what the nature of them is. Exactly. So like you said, we have to be particular on what uh, parts of the coconut trunk are used for what 
uh, structural and non-structural elements. And going back to the density, um, so on the right, uh, that twig looking item, uh, that's actually one of those pieces of vascular bundles extruded from the log. And so those are what you want to look for in the wood. So uh, these images of various pieces of coconut sections put together uh, gives you an idea of what you want to look for in expecting what parts of logs are used for what items. And so uh, the bottom image uh, with the four pieces put together, of course, the far left has the least densities and the uh, and uh, probably not good for structural items. And then the ones on the far right are good for structural items, whether they're blue lamp together or nail lamp together, or whether they're used as standalone pieces, but they'll be strong enough to withstand uh, the loads as a structural uh, element. Mm -hmm. and, and you were uh, sharing with us that uh, it's so amazing that they go all the way from the very bottom to the very top continuously, right, these bundles. Exactly. So that's, that's pretty impressive. And you were sharing last time that Christian and crew got excited about, because they almost look like the nails they're using, right? The wood nails. So they, there's an interesting sort of uh, family membership between them. Let's go to the next slide here. Um, what was the next process here that we see in this image? Yeah, so uh, these images here are actually taken from a process in making uh, wood flooring, coconut wood flooring. So I was uh, seeing how they do their process as far as their milling machines and their techniques and their holding. And so, you know, just learning from their process and their techniques and, and taking it back to my own research and my own application. Um, so going through the entire process of cutting off the outer bark area, uh, extruding out the the parts that are wanted, whether they're medium density or high density uh, pieces of uh, the center or the core or the peripheral area of the coconut log. And then the diagram on the left uh, showing the density of the wood uh, in various heights of the coconut tree. So as you see at mm -hmm. 20 feet or 65 feet, uh, you'll have what types of um, densities you'll find as you extrude the logs that are needed. Yeah. And the hands-on methodology we're applying next slide is basically you then, uh, again, applying that sort of theoretical knowledge that you gained from, from peers here again, practicing it yourself, right? Exactly. So after I had uh, slabbed these woods up and had them dried, um, then I took them to the planer machine, took them through the table saw machines. And from here, being able to not only one, understand what it takes to go through this process, but also understanding some of the manpower that it takes, some of the timing uh, that it takes um, uh, to be able to put this together and understanding the viability of uh, creating this type of uh, nail lamps that I'll eventually be putting together and how much effort it takes into just making uh, a sample and then uh, multiplying that into actually making you know, a, a whole apartment or house or a, a tiny house or whatever have you. Mm -hmm. And that assembly we see on the next slide here, um, you once again already had bought the nail gun before you left. And then, you know, then uh, Christian and crew switched it out for the, the newest one. And then you brought that back and basically continued here. And when we had pointed out that uh, your other sort of partner in crime was Ian Robertson from the UH Manoa College of Engineering. And he was then basically stepping in and building upon where he had left with Christian and crew, right? Exactly, yes. Uh, so here, like we said, uh, going through the entire process from the milling all the way down to actually nailing them together with the Ligno lock nails. And uh, once we had those put together, uh, we planned it out with Ian, um, how we can strategically do some testing as far as testing in shear um, and testing for um, you know, various ways of how we would hold this together, whether whether they be up, standing up or whether they be uh, vertical or horizontal. And so... Uh, and let's give us an idea about that and go to the next slide because here it's uh, illustrated pretty well. Exactly, yeah. So here uh, you have us uh, compression. So, so we did compression testing as well as shear testing as well as bending strength testing. So here um, we have some blocks that we're doing compression testing in just to get some numbers and understand the type of strength that we have uh, with this type of local Hawaii uh, coconut wood. 
And um, so great results from that. And if we continue on to the next slide, uh, we also have some testing in uh, shear as well. And so having a, finding a good proper nailing pattern, uh, we tested whether there were three boards nailed together or four boards nailed together and having uh, what kind of results come from that. So you can see the nailing pattern, the diagram on the right, how we held them together and how many nails. And then we could figure out how much uh, each nail contributes to the holding power in shear. So we had great results from that. Yeah, let's go to the next slide and see bending as well, which you mentioned before. Exactly. So also doing some bending testing. And uh, these logs, they had great results, but to be honest, um, they weren't the most uh, dense uh, sections of the coconut wood. So we could even have better results if we were a little bit picky in selecting the peripheral areas of the coconut logs and uh, you know, understanding more of the bending strength of the coconut logs. Yeah. And when we go to the next slide, it's introducing to us uh, another aspect that um, is potentially holding this back from being, um, you know, enthusiastically embraced by the industries and the authorities and the Department of Permitting and Planning, and that's this fire rating. And explain how you confronted that. Exactly. So, you know, that's often the question using uh, wood in uh, all wood in the structural building is uh, the potential for fire. And so I really want to do my own test. And although this is not one of those uh, ASTM E119 official tests, uh, I think we still yielded great results from this. So I had nailed together uh, about six boards myself, put together my own rig uh, with the torch and putting it on a platform. And I wanted to do a one hour testing. So I burnt it uh, with a torch about nine inches away from the sample piece and burnt it from one hour straight. So through this uh, time-lapse uh, images, you can see how much uh, char we got out of that one hour of fire testing. And what's also astonishing as well is when I put my hand as well as use a thermometer to measure the, uh, the thermal heat that is going through, it was very minimal. I believe it was at about 119 degrees was the highest that it got, but averaging at about 107 degrees Fahrenheit on the back side of these. And these are about five and a half inches thickness. So on the back side, we're only getting about 110 to 119 degrees temperature. Mm -hmm. And at the top right, we make a quote to a previous show with um, the department, um, the fire department uh, and Honolulu Fire Department and its assistant uh, fire chief Socrates Pratakos, hi Socrates, and, and he's very interested in, in your work and, and innovations on the island. And the article I was throwing in was, was my project that I was able to help you with uh, in the same tectonics almost two decades uh, before. And we had Germany's most experienced and expertise fire rating engineer, Dr. Huss, working with us uh, in a very creative way, leading to that our 40,000 square foot school was getting by without sprinkler systems and with only two uh, sections that were, uh, you know, uh, blocked off uh, in, in the hallways when uh, fire, you know, breaks out in one part and the smoke detectors close the doors. So a, a very kind of a low key preventive, uh, um, uh, you know, case based on the same finding that you experienced once again, firsthand, even risking burning your hand, but you knew it wouldn't burn. So you could trust that pretty well. And we also should thank the Polynesian Culture Center, right? Who is one of your many employers who also allowed you to do that over there, right? Yes, exactly. And a big thanks to them. They were a major part in, uh me using their mill shops and using a lot of their uh, resources and their um, manpower to assist me with uh, putting together a lot of these testings that I did. Spent many hours and lots of long nights in their shops uh, putting these samples together. Yeah, and a true uh, doctor of architecture you are, you didn't leave it with a theory. You wanted to apply this uh, research uh, to a potential project. So let's go to the next slide and uh, share that with the audience. Can you 
Sure. So uh, in selecting a uh, potential for this to become a reality um, led us to needing to pick a site and actually proposing uh, a real life scenario where this could be built. And so in looking throughout the islands, I wanted to select uh, a section of Waikiki in the very beginning area of Waikiki, the fruit, Fort de Russi area, because historically there was quite a few coconut trees here and the early royalty purposely planted quite a few trees here. And this was a residence uh, where they found relaxing and uh, there was many royal homes that were built here and the royal family stayed here. So this beginning part of Waikiki in the Fort de Russi area um, is where we selected for our site. And if we move to the next slide, so we have a diagram of the location in the area. You can see historical pictures, how there was always coconut trees in the area. So it's not something that's new or just forcing this type of, um, this type of model to this place, but it's always been that there was coconut trees abundant in these areas. Yeah, and for the people who don't might not recognize that this is our jungle uh, of a different kind, our Cumbria jungle right now, Waikiki, that looked way more natural back because there's Diamond Head and you have that clear view of Diamond Head, which you for sure don't have anymore because you've got the artificial concrete mountains uh, in between you and, and Diamond Head these days. So uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide and get more particular about the site. Exactly, so uh, moving on and selecting the site, uh, there's an area right there in Fort de Russie where there's quite a few coconut trees and a big open land. And another reason why I wanted to select this area here in Honolulu is that I feel there's an opportunity for a lot of our visitors who come to the islands to be able to experience um, one of our natural resources that is the coconut tree. You know, oftentimes tourists want to come here, they want to see these coconut trees, but um, all they see is coconut trees without any coconuts on them. So sometimes they don't even know if they're looking at a coconut mm -hmm. tree or some other type of palm tree. And so what I wanted to build here in this uh, peripheral Waikiki area is a cultural center that pays homage to the coconut tree itself. So a coconut cultural center right here near Waikiki where uh, visitors could walk to if they didn't have the opportunity to go around the entire island and visit a place like the Polynesian Culture Center or go to some of our uh, other cultural areas throughout the island like Waimea Valley and such. Mm -hmm. So the um, type of architecture that I, prof that I profiled it after was a uh, type of shadow box, you know, keeping it very, uh, um, just a lot of structure in there so you could see the structural components of the wood itself. So that's the reasoning for that picture of a shadow box there. Yeah, because shadow is what we need first and foremost and some shelter from the rain, but the rain isn't as, um, you know, like in this year, we're just talking before the show that we had a hot muggy day like in the 90s and uh, there's a thunderstorm rolling through that brings it down to the 50s here. We don't have that in Hawaii, right? Temperature is always more or less the same. So we really don't have to worry. So I really wanted to embrace the elements in your project and sort of going back from the kind of invasive hermetic, you know, sealing your building off basically and, and really catch the breeze and catch the wind and catch the sun by at the same time providing enough shelter. And also I think the, the kind of the zoom into the nature of the graininess of a, of a palm tree, right? There's something beautiful about palm trees as we're talking about on, on many levels, both on the sort of the, the pragmatic side, the kind of scientific side that you were pointing out before, but also on the, on the sort of poetic or kind of tactile side. So let's uh, jump to the next picture and uh, share the, the next step in your design process. Exactly. So taking it from that and understanding what kind of design I wanted to follow after, and uh, following this uh, shadow box type of architecture, this is a floor plan and a building that I came up with or a cultural center. And so uh, being in the three level structure, um, lots of louvered windows on the front side as well as the back side, oriented um, to be able to maximize on the amount of shade that uh, was provided here on this uh, southern side of the island, as well as maximize on the winds, um, natural ventilation. Uh, coming through the building. So with uh, many louvers on the uh, north and south side, 
Uh, we get a lot of breeze coming through as well as at an angle from the east as well as the west, so coming down from the mountains. And so this building, although it looks beautiful, it is also very comfortable um, to the, for the users within the space. Yeah, and to illustrate how beautiful it will be, let's go to the next slide and share a suggestive illustration of it and explain what we see, please. Exactly. So a uh, three-level structure with a rooftop uh, trellis on, on, the, on the top as well. And uh, one, um, proving its structural stability and being used um, as a, a, for the coconut wood to be used as structural components, uh, but mostly as it is put together uh, nailed with those legal lock nails. And so you can be able to see as much coconut wood as possible. So used as far as in the stairs, in the trellis up on the roof, in the structural walls, in the louvered uh, windows on the outside, in the flooring and the ceiling. So exposing as much of this natural coconut wood as possible. Yeah. And while probably many of, of your peers have and, and would have probably even rightly so stopped and say, this is enough, enough is enough, not you. So let's jump to the next slide because once again, you were digging in and diving in deep, right? Exactly. Deeper. So <laughs> I got more of my samples. And uh, like I said in the beginning, I really wanted to get a hands-on understanding of what it takes to put this together. So I got more samples. And uh, Joey Valenti on my committee, he introduced me to um, Elmer and his team over at Waimanalo Woods. Of course, in Waimanalo, they were so kind enough and generous enough to let me uh, put a, a bunch of samples in their uh, kilns. And we stuck it in there for just under two months until we could get a moisture content of about 18%. And once we were mm -hmm. able to do that, um, you know, they let me know just a couple of days before our final critique that it's ready. So mm -hmm. I had about two days to, as quick as I could, put together my oh. sample. Okay, show us your all-nighter outcome. Next slide. Yes, and there we go. So I quickly uh, put together a design uh, for my one-to-one -one sample. And I wanted to show the floor section, uh, ceiling section, uh, the upper floor section, as well as the party wall in between, as well as the louver windows. So uh, this is me stacking those logs once they've been, uh, once they've been put through the table saw, as well as the planers to get them to the right size and dimensions. Yeah, if and I put a reference up there again to, uh, me sharing my battle wounds with you and saying when I did this crazy school for mentally disabled children and was suggesting this sort of solid timber tectonics to my client, he said, I think you need more treatment than my kids. And then I said, before you fire us, um, give me 3,000 euros and I build you a full scale mock up. And um, I gave him three weeks and put it in his hallway. And uh, every morning he called me, I had another reason he thought why well, I wouldn't fly and I lived through it and at the you know at the final day he said um, okay damn it do it but get it out of my hallway because it's a fire hazard and then I said well thank you for assigning a fire rating engineer and I got Dr. Huss on board this is how that went so nothing beats the real deal uh, emerging guys join us in, in, in the reciprocity of the thinking and the making of architecture it's really the method that we can really uh, recommend as you can tell and on the next slide here we'll see again um, uh, again how you put it together and what it became explain more in detail please exactly so continuing this design of this one-to-one -one component model um, it took me about two days to uh, two long days and nights actually to put this whole thing together and it came out beautifully you know seeing the party walls seeing the exterior side as well as being able to look on the interior of this um, and understanding what the, how beautiful it is to look in and out of a louver window and have that breeze come through. And so it came out beautiful. And one of my only regrets is not being able to uh, show this off in our final critique or in our final presentation because of this COVID-19 thing, because I feel, you know, seeing it and touching it, smelling it, you would. You will, you will hopefully do it in the fall when we reopen and you will hopefully share it with us. And 
Let's go to the next slide because instead you were again using your computer skills and doing suggestive illustrations. So this is an animation of yours that shows how beautiful it filters the light and how beautiful the warmth of that very beautiful wood um, will, will play off and, and support. And uh, next slide and last slide here once again uh, illustrated through the real deal. This is your sample again and this is this is how it would look like. And uh, we're getting close to the end of the show. And uh, again, thank you so much uh, for having shared your journey with us, which was quite a ride and uh, well worth it. And um, I hope many of the future emerging generations are going to be inspired by that and are not afraid to uh, go the same path of, again, of architecture not being something that's abstract, uh, but something that's real. And um, also, as you shared with us, there's some real interest from the industries, both on the island and off the island. So in the best sense of the case, I hope this is, I know this will not be the end. This is actually the beginning for a career as, as a woodpecker. Uh, and uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to uh, continue to um, hear from you and 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 uh, hear from your successes as as a wood pioneer uh, on the island and beyond. So yes, thank you so much, and thanks for giving me another chance and another platform to be able to share this. I think it's really important, and there's a lot of opportunity here, not only for the local people here in Hawaii, but for a lot of, a lot of other tropical nations as well, to so apply this understanding of this knowledge. So thank you so much, Martin. Appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah. And again, although it wasn't intentional, none of us knew what would come, but I think you were right on. You had a sensitivity for, this is a good example for that practices in the future can't and won't be as they were before. So I think yours fits right in, as we said at the very beginning, as a perfect kind of post-pandemic uh, problem prop solving proposition and so I think it's a very, it's a very valuable and not only I think I'm biased because I was honored to be you know guiding you through but also many of my colleagues were really fascinated and extended their congratulations uh, after your review so um, thanks again for that and uh, now I let you off the hook and go back to your other babies <laughs> and to the other children. And again, thank you so much for having shared with us your exciting project, Kelly. Great, thank you so much, Martin. Have a wonderful day. Aloha. All right, bye-bye.